So I'm going to start because I'm the MC and that's my job. And I'm going to fiddle. Like with a microphone, I guess. Yeah. Otherwise, it might be entertaining. This first piece is called Charles Bukowski's Greatest Mistake. It is a response to Bukowski's um, book from 85 or so, War All the Time, and especially his title poem, War All the Time. Um, poems 1981 to 1984. Um, Bukowski, you know, was a pretty old guy at that point, and he lived on the outskirts of LA, San Pedro. And the poem involves him doing one of those typical, you know, old suburban guys things, mowing the lawn. And the older suburban guy from across the way says, hey, I thought you were a big tough guy with all these radical important poems, and here you are mowing the lawn. And Bukowski waves and smiles and says, when this shit really hits the fan, that's when guys like that are going to know. Which um, I suppose is a very comforting thing to tell yourself when you're an old poet. I, um, I guess I'll find out. Um, Charles Bukowski's greatest mistake. Coffee by day, tequila by night, and clear the putty from around the washing machine hose, change the lock on the daughter's door, argue your parking rights with a city employee, and tell the neighbor why his cousin's in jail. The computers you hated talk to us now, and the bills you avoided are all long overdue. Poets look for angles like a mayor would in dare, and we no longer notice when we go to war. It is war all the time, Bukowski. It always was. And when the cameraman is rolling, we are all beating your woman, though we aren't too young for justice and won't grow too old for chaos, and you are always full of shit. That shit that always hits the fan. And you can still spot a pacifist because he won't quit after the armistice, because every poet is a militant just looking for a weapon he'll never have to put down. This is your war, Charles Bukowski. We lost because you forgot it was on. Do you remember the night he called you names? Do you remember the names he called you, the names you called you, the names you struggled so hard to abandon, the names you worked so hard to earn? And now you're fragile like a straight flush, working and writing backwards, erecting your defenses like an empire's building of state, standing like a mission that knows that only it can save us from the tourists and Rhode Islanders biking in the park, turning your skin to Pepto-Bismol since your heart will always burn. Can you remember the truth behind the machismo? Before civility and sympathy made you competent at the sort of interactions you know full well don't matter. Before adulthood found you burying the strength that you need most. But I don't have a fortress. I just have a paradox in which the devil cannot find a place to set down his ground rules. And I hide in self-perception like the minotaur's hot breath proceeding from Blavatsky's table where she keeps the hand grenades. And I, I call this security, though I know how lost I am. And I call myself triumphant because this maze will outlive me, standing naked as a heart attack among the radiant leaves of weed. What they don't tell you is that she sets herself on fire. They don't tell you how she looks at her massive beak and ferocious claws and calls herself a blunted, broken fool. So she builds a pyre out of conversations with God 
and country pop records. She finds furnaces in Odessa and New Iberia. They don't tell you that she uses ethics for fuel, mixes them with morals and sets religious writers aflame, monks and mystics hissing in her fat. She lives off poetry now. She drinks it like tequila and shits it out the same, leaving the rest of us with politics and power games. And any poet and poem that doesn't stick to her intestines is one she never has to read again. They don't tell you how she kills every self-declared picara. And their immolation is the only thing that makes her fly. This next one is called The Way Buckeyes and Beers Taste Just Like the Lone Star. Um, if you've ever been to Ohio, there is a regional, very cheap, low-quality lager there called Buckeye. Um, it tastes exactly like the regional, low-quality lager called Lone Star in an entirely different section of the country. I don't, they're, they're not similar as far as I can tell. They're the same beer. Um, so, so yeah, The Way Buckeyes and Beers Taste Just Like the Lone Star. So the ink-stained asphalt stretched before me across that dotted yellow line, sleeping like a leather dom who never looks inside. And all the stars came out to celebrate my reminiscing in all the places that are deserted and all the places that are brave. And I remembered a thousand points of light when all the cigarettes could burn in unison. So I sat down with O'Reilly in Montezuma's bed to dream the sweet, hard heart of Stettin Island on game night. I have wrapped my lips round Indians east and west who tried to teach me to love folks who weren't like me, but I sank my thumbs deep in Schenectady and mud, and remembered I never loved no folks at all. I don't mean to get political. I just remember great uncle Jack told us to travel like a child, even after Pappy shot that hole in grandma's head. I lived for a while in a, a sort of arts commune in northern Ohio. Um, I, I was I, I rented a cell there for one hundred and forty dollars a month, and in, in, in you know this century, it was uh, a cell. It was um, it used to be a nunnery, so I, I was sleeping in a nun's cell um, in this in this arts commune in this former nunnery. Um, and you know, artists there are able to live just extremely cheaply and get studio space extremely cheaply. It's it's really a wonderful institution. Um, I, I mean, with with those kinds of low rent, a, a an aspiring artist or or writer or whatever um, can live there really without the distractions of a day job or very much of a day job and you know simply have the distractions of living with a hundred psychotic would-be artists so yeah which I mean, I mean is preferable sometimes and we are building a new religion but not all with the same gods and we are sleeping in this nunnery where no vow of silence ever meant as much as the lunatic pounding the piano with a perfect sense of rhythm, but no desire for grace. The ringmaster is warning us of the dangers of gossip while he's sucking off the cultist who's got no place to stay. The opera singer is warning me not to wear my glasses because the doctors are conspiring to eliminate my race. And I'm okay. And it's a cold, lake eerie winter. But I have a mattress and a cell that's really quite warm. And I've got a couple 40s stored right outside this window where the architecture rises like ten drunk slobs on minarets slouching towards ecstasy against a bullet-ridden sigh. And the mice stay in the basement where they used to keep the pregnant sisters, waiting for the unpredictable century to be born.
This next piece is um, it's an answer to Matthew Arnold's Victorian love poem, Dover Beach. Um, it's called The Pale of Soleil. The Pale of Soleil was the piece of France that was owned by England for a few centuries. I think, I think they got it back in war, after World War I. Um, it is directly across the English Channel from Dover Beach. So Soleil overlooks the English Channel. You know, it overlooks Dover. Um, it, um, yeah, The Pale of Soleil, a, a much, much bloodier history than Dover. If parts of our love are true, we are still both liars. As was every charming prince who sullied our dark names. And if beauty is something real, we will still die ugly, finally forgetting our glories and our shames. So let us not pretend that mortal love is holy, nor that this blessing of our union makes it perfect. And let us not retreat too far into the fantasies we share, lest close attention reveal them as the little things they are. Darling, we have learned of the wars within and without us, we know that victory is something none can justly claim. So let us learn to make love with the darkling plain. It's the only love we have left. Thus did Saradwin and Jesus fight like Eliot and pound. While Che sang to Evita on what matters here on the ground, and all their manifestos mean nothing to me now. Your gods are the biggest joke since the Bible. A failure celebrated can never push through the samsara of gender to reach something new. So if we are all destined to love and to lose, let me suffer without any comforts. And the lies that you tell to make your lies worth living can rot with the flesh of our culture. Take instinct and reason and all our deceit. Take Brando in Paris and take my wife please. But when you take that money and you fucking leave, let us both understand what we've come to. We've defiled our flag as fire never could. We've built these stone fortresses from tools of bad wood. Our symbols replace that for which they have stood. They shield us from truth and self-torture. But you were never a woman. And I was never a man. Our bodies are not what divides us. I'm going to do one more. This is the poem written inside a McDonald's within a Walmart. Um, the, the Walmart in question is on the west side of El Paso, which is funny because there is no west side of El Paso. If you've ever looked at a map of West Texas, the Rio Grande curves north at El Paso. The west side of El Paso then, if there was such a thing, would be the poorest sections of Juarez. It is rather essential for not only the Texas um, imagination, but the American imagination to forget that the poorest sides of Juarez exist. Therefore, the west side of El Paso has to curve this way, northward, and we must call this northern section of El Paso the west side, lest we face what's on the other side of the river. But this Walmart is on the far west side of El Paso before you get to the next town, Canotillo, which Canotillo is the place that looks like the El Paso of Quentin Tarantino's imagination. Um, far west side of El Paso and the McDonald's Inn therein is 24 hours. So if you are on the west side of El Paso, you know where to go. I had to pull off the road, he told me. I was so excited, so happy. All at once, I've realized that eventually 
everyone I hated was going to die. And I thought that our love would live forever. So I write this poem to wish it goodbye. And this paper will crumble, the words forgotten, the hard drive deleted, the internet obsoleted, the electrons finally rendered inert. The institutions that bring you such power, such terror, won't be a footnote in an unremembered text. And the gods of your forefathers remain immortal as long as your fantasies stay naif. Ah, uh, but you were never a naif. Still I believe you are holy, that the holy and the unholy die, that nothing that dies is unholy. And I believe you have power to reach everything that's long since gone, to embrace what will happen tomorrow. And if these beliefs leave me grasping for some fantasy my mind will reject, I'll treat this Walmart as something greater than myself and pretend human failures can have historical context. Thank you.